Lots of you heard about the drone incidents in the airports in the UK. This talk is the Great British Drone Panic by Jenny List. She's talking about um, asking for a better standards of official investigation and media reporting into the British drone incident stories. Give her a warm applause for Jenny List. Um, my background is that uh, I'm uh, a journalist. I write for Hackaday.com, who many of you may know. Um, I'm also a member of two makerspaces and hackspaces in the UK. I'm a member of Oxford Hackspace and Milton Keynes Makerspace. Um, and my background is that I'm an electronic engineer who worked in publishing for most of her career. And so. After I left the Oxford Dictionaries, where I used to work, I started writing for Hackaday. And I found myself dealing with multi-rotor stories, drone stories, as they are in the popular press. Um, and I found I was getting to know people who flew multi-rotors, drones. And I found that they were rather unhappy about the way that their hobby was being portrayed. Um, particularly that uh, there were a lot of sort of stories of drones in uh, conflict with aircraft or whatever. Uh, and there were a very, they, they considered it to be a very unfair reporting of how that was happening. And they were very concerned, but they didn't know what to do. And so I sort of gained an interest in the subject and realized that there was quite a story here. And so I started writing about it for Hackaday. Now, before I start, there's one thing that I absolutely have to say. Flying drones at people is bad. If you're here wanting to fly drones near an airport, if you want to fly over a crowd without the appropriate licensing and all the safety stuff, if you want to fly it near aircraft, I have one thing to say for you, get out. The only way that the multi-rotor community will be taken seriously is if they make sure that what they do, they do in as safe a manner as possible. I'm saying this now because the subject of the talk, there may be people who will say, oh yes, it's another hacker talking about drones, and they'll just say how bad pilots are and say that they can fly anywhere. No, that is not the case. If you fly a drone near aircraft, you deserve to go to jail. However, I guess I got into this about 2015, 2016, and one of the first major articles I did for Hackaday about it was, I went through 2015's British drone incident reports. And what was very striking about them is that they were all, they all involved uh, reports of drones and multi-rotors that just didn't add up. You know, they were sort of, descriptions of a drone that didn't match any known drone. They were at enormous altitudes, which drones just couldn't fly to. Uh, they were at great speeds or whatever. And so I went through all the um, drone incident reports for a year and just did a little bit of analysis. Not as huge in-depth analysis, but just said, this is what's being uh, reported. How does it stack up? Uh, and the result was this article. Uh, I've just picked one incident as a sort of typical example. This is a completely normal performance of an average drone. It was Airpox report number 2015-155, and it's over Stansted Airport, which is one of London's smaller airports. Uh, a Boeing 737, so quite a big uh, airliner, um, was climbing after taking off, so it was at 4,000 feet, and it was doing 250 knots, which is nearly 300 miles an hour. My apologies, Continental friends, I don't quite know what that is in kilometers per hour, but it's a lot. Uh, the drone was sighted at 12 o'clock, so there's a, you're flying along at 300 miles an hour, and there's a drone flying towards you really quickly. Wow. And then, before it hits you, it does an about turn and flies away at 1 o'clock, so it's coming in that direction, it's flying out at that direction. Now, 
completely normal performance of an average drone. I don't think fighter aircraft can do that. If you have a drone that can do that, I want that drone because it's awesome. I'm guessing that if you have a drone that can do that, I'm guessing Uncle Sam wants that drone and will come to you with lots of billions. The fact is that this is being reported as a drone, completely matter of fact, by the official body that looks at air proximity incidents. And there was no question as to whether it was or wasn't a drone. In the official record, it's a drone despite the fact that no drone could possibly do that. And in that, I, of course, saw my story, because uh, when the official record is just so blatantly wrong, what journalist wouldn't want to question it? So I went through, well, a couple of years of the odd drone story, sort of somebody sighted a drone near Gatwick and they closed it for like an hour or something. Somebody sort of saw a drone near aircraft, those kind of stories. Um, and then came December 2018. I think it was with the 18th or something like that. It was an evening in December, so it's getting dark. I think it was quite a cold evening, there was a frost. I don't think it was raining from memory. Um, anyway, un in the freezing cold of a British winter evening, under the glare of the arc lights on the tarmac, some, one of the guys who drives a trolley around or whatever, airport workers, saw something flutter in the corner of their um, view. I don't know the actual incident that was reported because the authorities haven't released it, but let's say it was something like that. They reported it because you have to report it. And somebody said the D word, drone. And they closed the airport. That's actually the right thing to do. It's absolutely the right thing. If somebody sees, or thinks they've seen a drone over an airport, it's the right thing to do because they have to investigate it, make sure it's safe. Because if you are flying in an aircraft, you need to be kept safe. So closing the airport actually was the right thing to do. So they close the airport, it's full of people going off on their Christmas holidays, and you've got, I don't know, tens of thousands of people just sitting there bored, looking around, and of course they're told there are drones in the air, so they start seeing drones. They see drones everywhere, so sightings keep coming in. And this is just normal uh, behaviour. Um, I mean, for instance, as an analogous thing, last week I was at the Danish hacker camp, Bornhack, as an aside, if any of you want to go to Bornhack, do it. It's an amazingly chilled camp. I had an amazing time. But there were one or two people on one of the fields complained they had tick bites. And the minute you know there are ticks, like you're looking for ticks, and every little mole or spot or piece of dirt or anything on you, like, oh, no, it's a tick, and you're seeing ticks everywhere. And of course, there aren't any ticks. Um, and it's exactly the same. It's human nature. If you're told that there is a threat, you're going to start seeing it everywhere. So what happened is these sightings kept on coming in, and uh, so they kept the airport closed overnight. Uh, and then we're into the next day, and it gets a bit silly at this point, because one of the um, British tabloid newspapers, uh, I think it was the Daily Mail, had a, a video on their website. And it, it was the, the Gatwick drone, and it was just a grey sky. I think you saw some lamp posts across the corner of it at one point, with a drone flying, and there was somebody in the background saying, there's the bastard! And this was widely shared around social media everywhere. And there was only one small problem with this. There was nothing in the video that identified it as being at Gatwick. Now, I'm not saying that uh, a journalist and a drone flyer stood in the Daily Mail car park, but uh, this was widely reported as the Gatwick drone. But when you have a video of something, it helps if it has something that can tie it to a place, because without that, it's our old friend, fake news. And it got into sort of almost hysterical levels that, uh, you know, Superman, where are you? Can nobody save us? Uh, but don't worry. The police arrested somebody. They arrested a couple, actually. Uh, and they've done their job, so we're safe. We can sleep safe, uh, except uh, this happened. Uh, what, what they'd actually done, in the manner of high-quality police work everywhere, they'd searched Facebook for the closest drone enthusiast and they'd rounded up the usual suspects, because that always works. Um, it worked in the 1970s for IRA bombs. Uh, it worked when they were chasing terrorists after September the 11th. Uh, and evidently, it worked here too. 
but it completely ruined a couple's life. Um, it was breathlessly reported as they were the culprits, and of course they weren't, and it used vast police um, resources, and meanwhile, if there had been a drone at Gatwick, whoever was still on the go. Um, and of course, the sightings kept coming in. Uh, And so they kept the airport closed for another day. I think it was three days in total they kept it closed. And they even said they found wreckage. And like, okay, um, this is really interesting. Can we see this wreckage? Um, because, you know, drone wreckage, that's actual physical, tangible evidence. But uh, no, they were investigating it, so we couldn't see it yet. And then uh, this happens. Police say there is a possibility that there well, was never a drone. And it all faded from you very, very quickly, and we were never allowed to speak of it again. But the airport had been closed for three days. So they closed the airport for three days, and then sort of very quietly and sort of shamefacedly admitted that there basically probably wasn't a drone there at all in the first place. But the trouble is, received opinion. The public and the politicians and the media have been conditioned. There was a drone at Gatwick. So received opinion is now that there was a drone at Gatwick. It's endangered flights, cause huge disruption, and drone flyers are bad, OK? And it's not true, obviously. Um, but that's the danger, that's the power that the media holds, that if they say it enough, and if the authorities say it too, then it's the truth, no matter if it basically wasn't the truth. Uh, there's no evidence, but there was that wreckage. Um, and we've never been shown the wreckage. Now, at this point, I'm going to take you on a little trip down memory lane. Manchester, October 2013. The media reported that some bloke in Withenshaw was printing 3D printed guns in his basement. And there was a great press release, uh, press conference where they excitedly showed these photographs. And uh, the box sets a MakerBot Replicator 2, or 3, 3, MakerBot Replicator 3. And the things on the right are a trigger for a 3D printed gun and a barrel for a 3D printed gun. And then the um, RepRap community said, hang on. I don't quite know what the so-called trigger is, but I think it's part of the extruder for a, for a rep wrap of the time. And I think the barrel is the sticky-outy thing that you put your reel of filament on. Yeah, the police basically raided some bloke who was making rep wraps, which probably a great chunk of you have done at some point, uh, and decided that these innocuous parts were 3D printed guns, because that's the quality of British policing. If they see something... I mean, I'm not saying that some policeman found a broken desk fan in the grass somewhere and said it was a drone, but we never saw the drone, so draw your own conclusions. Uh, so, yeah, it all faded away. The police were mildly embarrassed, but the public, as far as the public was concerned, the Gatwick had been closed because of drones. Middle of January, about a month later, there's drones again at Heathrow. And it's nice and close to London. Basically, the mass media journalists, they never like going far. So they all hot-footed it out. You can go to Heathrow on the tube. So they all hot-footed it out, Heathrow. And there were lights in the sky. There it is, finally, absolute proof. So lots of drone reports kept coming in. Heathrow was closed for an evening. Uh, and then a bit later in the evening, it was opened up again. The threat had been seen off. Now, lights and a drone, and a drone that's up for quite a long time. Now, the community started to smell a rat. And a guy in the drone community, a guy called Andrew Hyams, he's also a Hackaday reader, he um, contacted me and he'd done a look on ADSB. Now, ADSB is, uh, I can't go into the full technical details because it's not my area of expertise, but it's the beacon system that commercial aircraft carry. Uh, they effectively, rather than relying on sort of active radar, passive radar rather, they, uh, is it active radar? traditional old-fashioned radar, they instead, each plane has a beacon that says, hello, I'm me, and this is where I am. And there are people who have networks of RTL, SDR type things uh, that log it all to the web. So you can go back in time and you can say, on this particular evening, what aircraft are where? And he found the drone. 
uh, it's in the map on the right. Um, and it's quite a well-known aircraft, and it's notorious. Some people don't find it welcome. It's one of the Metropolitan Police helicopters. <laughs> so what happened was, I think, I mean, the police won't say anything about this because, of course, it's a bit embarrassing to them. Uh, somebody said the D word. They scrambled the helicopter. The helicopter turned up. Somebody saw lights in the sky, so the helicopter went over to investigate. And effectively, I'm not saying that the helicopter went round chasing itself in the dark over Heathrow for an evening, but look at the ADSB records and where it went on the map and judge for yourselves. <laughs> so, yes again, received opinion is now that there was a drone flying over Heathrow and it caused everything to be closed. Drones are bad and it's one of the most dangerous phrases in British public discourse, of course, this something must be done. What that really means is the upper class twits who happen to be in power at the moment have to put down their brandy or whatever it is and uh, think, oh, oh you know, we, we, have to, we have to have to pass some laws or something. Oh, we are hard on those Johnnies, what, you know? Punishment, flog them, burn them, and all that kind of stuff. And so we get some laws. Often this means bad laws. Because let me take you deep into parts of the British psyche. The, all the gammons who quake in their Barrett homes at the thought of whatever the tabloid newspaper, the Daily Mail or the Daily Express tells them is the menace of the moment. They demand that something must be done. And their general reaction to everything, and it's been all through decades, is the British way. People are having fun. This must be stopped at all costs. And I've included a picture of a no ball game sign. Those actually have no legal meaning. But you will find no ball game signs in housing estates all across the United Kingdom because heavens, children might have fun and this must be stopped at all costs. I mean, in my lifetime, I was probably the first generation, I grew up in the 70s, first generation who uh, got skateboards and they were to be banned and people, must, people are having fun, this must be stopped. Uh, and then computer games, I was the first generation to get, I got a Sinclair ZX81 when I was 11 and they're rotting children's brains, children are having fun, this must be stopped at all costs. And then of course, when I was a student, it was all acid house rave music and people popping E, and as you imagine, they went off the scale on that one. Uh, so yeah, that's the level of reaction in British politics. Instead of saying, okay, let's look at the evidence here and find out what really happens, it's people must be stopped from having fun because they're flying drones. And so, yeah, we got some laws. As it happens, we're kind of lucky on the laws because one of the few players in all this who actually has a clue and knows what they're talking about is the UK Civil Aviation Authority. The CAA, generally, when they're dealing with anything to do with stuff in the air, they know what they're talking about, they don't go over the deep end. Their um, concern is the smooth and safe running of Britain's airspace. So in terms of what we actually got in the laws about drone flying, Anything above 250 grams, I believe from November, you'll have to pass some kind of test and you'll have to, I think, pay for a license. It's not a huge amount of money and I'm guessing the test is sort of stuff, do you know that you don't have to fly within the distance of people or an air base or whatever? I haven't been through the test myself. Personally, I've decided I'm not going to get the test. My drone flying is small toy drones which I basically just got to learn how to fly, so I'd know something about it. I'm not a drone flyer. But the law, that part of the law itself, is actually quite well thought out. I find it quite uh, an enticing prospect, the 250 gram drone thing. It's funny, when they we talked about this first, there was some government minister was saying, this will be a marvellous boost to the uh, British drone industry. And my first thing is, what British drone industry? But my second thing is, well, it'll be a marvellous boost to the Shenzhen drone industry. Because quite a few countries around the world are bringing in this 250 gram limit, which means that the guys in Shenzhen will be 
busy making amazing multi-rotors in a 250 gram form factor. So in, if you know things like the DJI Spark and things like that, it's about 350 grams, I think. Imagine in a couple of years' time, you'll be able to buy an equivalent of the DJI Spark that does way more stuff because it's two years' time in the future and only weighs 250 grams and you don't need a license for it. I'm waiting for those drones to appear because I want one. So that's the drone regulation side of it. The other side of it is a bit more worrying. It's your typical British government overreaction. It's the people are having fun. This must be stopped at all costs. New powers for the police. And I'm afraid new powers for the police are never good because they always overdo it, always do stupid things. They brought bringing in a thing where I think the police can seize drone equipment on site and I, I can't remember what the exact details are, but there's one of two other slightly sinister uh, things. And I know that at some point over the next year or two, I am going to be reporting on police harassment of drone flyers. I'm probably going to be reporting on some kid who's flying his DJI Spark sort of somewhere safe, and he's doing it responsibly, and he's doing it away from uh, an airport, not over people, but some gammon has rung up the police, and he's being carted off to the nick. I don't want to write those stories. I don't want you to be in that position. Please, all of you, be as responsible as you can. Please don't get yourself arrested, because I'm sure that the police will be looking for people to arrest. It's, that's the way they, they roll, isn't it? At this point, we start to see a bit of a fight back from the community. Um, first of all, DJI, obviously the world's largest manufacturer of multi-rotors, they have put in some very, very stiffly worded complaints and legal complaints about, I think to the BBC, about the quality of reporting, because there's been some desperately shoddy reporting on this. It's all underway at the moment. I've reported about the complaint going in to Hackaday, from Hackaday. Uh, I don't think that any results have come out yet, so uh, we'll, we'll wait and see on that one. But a little more interesting is a bunch of multiracial enthusiasts have come together and they formed this thing, Airprox Reality Check. Now, if you Google them, you go to their website, what they've done is they've gone through meticulously, they've come up with a load of criteria and a scoring system for air proximity reports. And they've gone through and scored every single air, prox, air proximity report that is supposed to have a drone. And they've worked out, you know, was this a drone? So things like the one at Stansted, where it couldn't possibly have been a drone. And if it wasn't a drone, what could it have been? And so, for instance, there are ones where, well, if you look at ADSB data, there, there was the, your aircraft here, but over here, somewhere in the distance at a different altitude, was another aircraft, which from a distance looked quite small. Was that what you saw? Because some of these things are coming in not from pilots, they're coming in from cabin crew, they're coming in from passengers and all sorts. And... So they're trying to analyze these, you know, analyze responsibly these reports. Uh, and it's quite an interesting read because they do have a very comprehensive guide to all the drone-related incidents in UK airspace. But the most interesting thing they've done, they put in a freedom of information request to the Air Proximity Board, uh, asking for what evidence they had of drone involvement. And this is probably... This is the smoking gun. I'm going to read it, even though you can read it off the board. In all cases, UKAB has no confirmation that a drone has flown close to an aircraft other than the report made by the pilots. Similarly, other than from the report of the pilots, UKAB has no confirmation that a drone was involved. That is thermonuclear. Because it's tempting here to say, oh, stupid pilots, they just don't know what they're looking at. Pilots are not stupid. Pilots are highly trained experts in what they do. Their job is to keep you, the passenger, safe. And they do an astounding job of that. Air transport is the safest way to get from A to B. It's an oft-quoted statistic that you're more likely to die in a car crash on the way to the airport than you are in uh, commercial aircraft, and there's a reason for that. Pilots are very good at what they do. The trouble is, when you get a, a site, 
um, a sighting report of a drone, it can't be considered reliable if there's nothing to back it up. Because flyers have seen things in the air since the dawn of flight. I mean, they've variously been First World War super weapons, they've been little green men, they've been Nazi super weapons, they've been Russian super weapons, they've been little grey men, whatever. To the point that if you say the word UFO, people laugh at you. When it's literally something unidentified in the air, be it a plastic bag or whatever. And so they don't want to say UFO because people go, ho, 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 he's a little green man. Uh, and so if they see something, unfortunately, the, it's a lot easier to say it was a drone. And so if somebody says there's a drone, it may well have been a drone, but without other evidence to corroborate what it was, whether it was within the distance of the aircraft or whether it was a drone, it can't be taken as reliable. And here's the problem. The Air Proximity Board, their reports provide the official record. So as far as the, the law is concerned, if it says it was a drone in the Air Proximity Board report, it was a drone, even if what they're actually saying is somebody said they might have seen a drone. And there's the nub of the problem that I'm talking about. So to come to the conclusion, what do we need? There are several angles to this. The first one is the Air Proximity Board themselves. We need meaningful incident reports. Now, it depends how the Air Proximity Board see their job. If their job is to investigate, they are not doing a good job at all. They are simply writing down a few things people tell them and displaying it as absolute fact. If that is their job, they are not being competent. However, if their job is just to report what people say, they need to be very, very clear that this is just reports of what people say. Because currently we're in the odd position where the public and the press and the government and that are treating their work as the official record of what actually happened, when in fact it's actually just a record of some people said this. Now, they need to very quickly decide which side of that coin they're on, and if they're not investigating, and these are not the official record of the truth of what actually happened, they need to be damn clear about that, and they need to make sure that their reports reflect that there is no evidence and no corroboration of drones appearing. I strongly suspect that they wouldn't be so lax in their reporting if the um, incidents... Uh, involved two airliners coming close to each other, but that uh, requirement for meaningful content seems to have become absent when the word drone is mentioned. I think whichever way they need to do a better job. Then we need competent police investigations. I mean, British police, they have a history of incompetence when it comes to major incidents that are beyond their normal remit of speed cameras and burglars and all those kind of stuff. I mean, when they, when they are embarrassed, they normally try to conceal it because they cannot be wrong. They've got a culture in which they cannot be wrong. So you get something like, oh, a few years ago after the September 11 attacks, they shot down this, shot this brilliant Brazilian bloke on the tube in London. And this tissue of lies fell away like the skins of an onion. First of all, he was a terrorist, and then they found, no, he's a Brazilian. Then it was, oh, he ran through the tube station and jumped over the barrier. No, he didn't, he used a ticket. And then, oh, he had a gun or something, I can't remember the full details, but this tissue of lies, and it came down to, no, we saw a brown bloke and we gunned him down. And they apply this to these kind of things. They cannot be wrong, they cannot backpedal, and so they paint themselves into this corner where they massively overreact and then they can't pull back from the edge. They have to go further and further and further. They do things like our bloke with the 3D printer earlier. They come up with utter rubbish and present it as absolute fact in front of the media. And when you've done that, you can't backpedal. They come up with so-called drone wreckage, which they're, since they haven't produced any, then I'm 
I think we can draw the conclusion there was no drone record wreckage. They just found some random stuff or didn't even find anything. And they do things like arresting the usual suspects. I mean, if you follow the history of the Troubles in Ireland, you'll have heard of things like the Birmingham pub bombers. Very nasty bombing in Birmingham. And the real bombers were let off scot-free. And they just went and rounded up some Irish builders and said they'd done it. In the case of the Gatwick closure, they just rounded up the nearest drone enthusiast because they had to have done it right. You know, and that's no way to investigate these kind of incidents. I think a simple rule of thumb should be if you don't know what you're doing or don't know what you're talking about, back away and hand over to somebody who does. I'm sure the CAA or whichever have investigators who know what they're talking about when it comes to things like this. The police should admit when they don't know something, admit when they've got something wrong and back away and everybody would have a much nicer time of it. Then we need a responsible press reporting. My apologies for that. Um, we need responsible press reporting. The standard of reporting in this has been the worst of the British gutter press. Sensationalism, outright lies, manufactured stories, I mean, things like that video that I'm not saying wasn't in the Daily Mail car park, but there's nothing to say it wasn't. Uh, we need responsible reporting when it comes to so-called experts. The typical thing the BBC would do when they're talking about a drone story would be to bring on an airline pilot. And the airline pilot would, of course, say, oh, yes, you know, drones are bad, OK? Because they don't know any better. They know nothing about drones. Talking to an airline pilot about a drone story is the rough equivalent of talking to a super canker captain about a kayak story. Because they're both boats, right? I mean... I'm sure if there was a super canker incident, they wouldn't bring in a kayaker or vice versa. So why are they bringing in an airline pilot to talk about a drone story? The BBC actually have expert drone flyers on their staff. One of them is a member of my makerspace. If you've ever watched BBC sports coverage, all the drone flights are done by super competent multi-rotor flyers. It, I, they can't tell me that they can't get an expert who knows what they're talking about on. They just haven't tried. And finally, we need comprehensive training of aircrew. And by aircrew, I mean cabin crew as well as uh, pilots. Now, we've all seen this uh, image. I haven't credited it. I don't know who did it. Uh, but it's gone all around the internet. Now, it's easy to stand in and go, ha, 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 pilots can't recognize drones. And it's not fair to have a go at pilots. It comes back to what I said earlier. Pilots are super competent people who you are entirely justified in putting your life in their hands because they know what they're doing and they do a very difficult job very well. This is just a little area of their job that is obviously deficient in their training. And to be honest, I think it would help all round if they were trained. This is what a drone looks like. This is what a drone looks like at this distance. This is what an aircraft can look like at that distance, kilometers away. And it's the danger that it can be mistaken from a, for a drone. I think that would really help. And it would help to ease tensions between the different communities that use the sky. Because I don't think responsible multi-rotor flyers want pilots to be annoyed with them. And to be honest, I don't think Pilots want to be annoyed by multi-rotor flyers, and I think that good training would help in this respect. Finally, we need to keep our own house in order. If we fly drones or multi-rotors, whatever we call them, we need to make sure that we do it by the book at all times. And if we encounter people who aren't doing it by the book, people who are thinking, oh, it's OK, I'll fly over an airport, nobody will notice, or I'll fly over a crowd, or I'll do stupid things, then they need to be brought to book, and we need to be on the right side in this. We can't afford to do the wrong thing here. The logo there is DroneSafe, dronesafe.uk. I think that's actually a website produced by the... Um, air traffic control people in the UK. 
and it goes through, it's a very sort of handy checklist and diagrams and stuff of where you can fly, how you can fly, and where you shouldn't fly, which is things like under 400 feet ceiling, uh, 50 meters away from people, uh, obviously not near um, airports or whatever. And if you're not sure whether you're near an airport or something, then it's easy enough. There are places online you can check that and it will show you on the map where you are and where the, the no-fly zone ends. For instance, about a week after the Heathrow, no, sorry, about after the Gatwick incident, there was a bloke arrested near Heathrow. He wasn't a terrorist or anything like that. He was some poor bloke who'd got a drone for Christmas and taken it to his nearby park to fly it. The trouble is his park was in West London right next to Heathrow. So he wasn't a bad drone flyer. He was what I think we would call a pillock. Uh, so we have to keep our house in order. Um, it's the responsibilities on the airprox board, the police, and the journalists, but it's just as much on us as the multi-rotor flying community. If we don't do this, part of the jigsaw isn't completed. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, Hackaday covers drone multi-rotor stories. If you follow the um, hackaday.com forward slash category forward slash drone hyphen hacks, you'll see both projects people have done with multi-rotors and you'll see the um, unfolding uh, air traffic control kind of stories that I've been talking about. With that, thanks very much for listening. And does anybody have any questions? This is a bit I'm scared about. <laughs> Thank you. I see the first question over there. Sorry. Uh, can you yes. hear me? Yeah, yes, right. I can. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry as you say you're afraid of questions. And nevertheless, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Uh, I was wondering one thing you didn't mention. Uh, if I remember correctly, the British Army was called in uh, with some drone surveillance gear and drone detection gear. Yes. Is that correct? And did anything surface out of what they did? Like we didn't see anything or we did see or, or whatever. So an, another uh, piece of the puzzle to say there was nothing at all. Not that Thank I you. am aware of, yes. I think it's another piece of the puzzle to say there wasn't anything at all. Generally, they call out the army not because they need the army, but because it's a public reassurance thing. Governments like doing that. They called out the army various times during the war against terror craze a few years ago, and it's a public thing. There's blokes in uniform with big guns, so we're all safe, right? Uh, so, yes, as far as I know, they didn't find anything. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, th yes. Thanks for your uh, talk. Um, uh, well, what I'm missing from the story is basically uh, should be possible, uh, given the British experience with, of radar, to actually detect drones with radar. Uh, because, well, you're having lots of experience with the chain home systems back uh, many years ago. Yeah. Uh, but there's also books to actually learn yourself concepts of radar. I mean, uh, Mark Denny wrote a book already in 2007 about many concepts that are used in uh, uh, radar. It's called Blip, Buzz, Buzz and Ping. It's very readable, even if you don't have a mathematical background. Yeah. And that way you can maybe also use passive radar to uh, detect drones. Now, as I understand it, I did ask this question of... I mean, the great thing about the, our community is there are people who know about all sorts of wonderful things. And I did actually find, through uh, my local makerspace associated community, somebody who's worked on radar all his life, military radars that you can't tell me about, so knew his stuff. And I asked him, why can't they just detect stuff? And what it came down to, as I understand it, now I'm not a radar expert, I'm just relaying, was that they have lots of radars on aircraft, but they're designed, uh, sorry, air airports, but they are designed to detect big airliners, they're not designed to take little drones. Now, I'm told that there are such systems that can detect drones, and these are the things the governments have, with great fanfare, said that's what they're investing in. Whether they can or not, I don't know. Now, I believe there is a transponder system being bought in by the FAA in the United States. Are there any American drone flyers here who can confirm that? Uh, but the trouble with the transponder system is all the really, like, legitimate and responsible flyers will fit the transponder. You get some pillock orders, this Simer or whatever from uh, um, Banggood, he's not going to put a transponder on it and he's going to fly. So the transponder system only works if everybody plays by the book. Mm. I hope that helps. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Anybody? Over there. <laughs> 
Um, I Hello. suppose it's a partially a question and partially uh, a statement, and that is one thing that has come to light in the UK at least recently is uh, the drone register as well, okay. where they're going to want people to register themselves, register their aircraft. Um, having just mentioned about that couple that got arrested because of a Facebook post about a model helicopter he had from years ago, um, one of my biggest concerns within the drone world especially is that all these entities that want people to register so that they can find you, they know you, they know who you are and where you are, without anyone really thinking about, you know, a criminal doesn't rob a bank with their getaway car being their daily driver. Uh, they don't put a neon sign that says, oh yeah, I'm robbing the bank, but I'm doing it safely or whatever. So if you're going to be, I don't know, flying at an airport illegally, Either you're so uneducated as to the legal system that you haven't registered, like you mentioned, um, and you're breaking the law, or you're intentionally not registering. And I wondered what your opinion is when it comes to, uh, if you've thought about any methodology f other than, say, DJI's geofencing yeah. system uh, for protecting people from themselves, essentially <laughs> stupid-proofing the technology. Well... That's actually, we did an Ask Hacker Day on that. Uh, you know, if detecting drones and stopping these things happening is so difficult, you know, what would the community suggest? And it's quite funny because half the community says, ah, oh, you're working for the man and you're asking us to come up with things without realising, no, we're just the community. I would say with the whole thing of being on the government list of enthusiasts or whatever, I don't see that as that sinister. And the reason is for my experience wearing another hat. I'm a radio amateur, which means I'm on a government list of radio amateurs. Probably half people in the audience are radio amateurs. And there are all sorts of people who do naughty things with the radio spectrum. And generally, they don't go after the local radio amateurs when that happens. They will often go and ask the local radio amateurs to help, and the radio amateurs will help. And I suspect that will probably happen with multi-rotor flyers as well, that when there's somebody doing dodgy things, they will ask the local multi-rotor flyers to do you know anything about this? And I'm guessing if they're responsible flyers, they'll say, well, actually no, or yes, depending on the answer. Um, as to other technologies, the answer is, it's not my field of expertise. Knowing who you are, by the way, this is Jared, one of the multi-rotor experts who got me interested in this story in the first place. Knowing who you are, I suspect you probably have more of an idea than I do about it. <laughs> Are there any questions? No. Okay, then thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. I would like to give her another applause. Thanks.